The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Schroeders is a global asset and wealth manager with broad expertise across public and private markets, investing on behalf of individuals, institutions and advisors. We support advisors to help their clients build successful portfolios to achieve their goals, whatever they may be. We are proud to be partnering with Ensemble to host a dedicated investment space on the Ensemble platform to have more meaningful conversations with their clients and to give advisors a more efficient way to engage with Schroeders. Join the Schroeders investment space on the Ensemble platform today. Hello, back for another episode. Uh, I'm James Wrigley. Today, I've got the pleasure of Renee Verco joining me from Money Mode, or your business is called Money Mode. Renee, thank you for, for joining me today. Good to have a chat with you. Oh, thanks, James. It's um, yeah, it's great to be able to have a chat with you, and thanks for having me on. <laughs> it's been a little while since we've had a it has. good been... chat anyway. As you're saying, we may as well uh, have a catch up and record the podcast at the same time. So tell me about Money, so money Mode. And actually, the name itself is interesting. Where's the name Money Mode? come from does it have some particular meaning to you or yeah yeah a good question because I ag- agonized over um you know my business name when I set my business up you know a few years ago and um for me it came about like you know I th- felt that the money conversation needed to be on the table like it's like we all work in finance and personal finance and dealing with people's money day to day but like it's almost like money's this secret language so I was like, you know, part of my philosophy is really, yeah, having that money conversation on the table and being really upfront about it. So I was like, well, I'm going to put money in my business name. And mode was really, you know, the way, you know, the way that you use it um, can be different for every person. So it's more about like money in your mode, if if you like, because um, also my, you know, big belief sort of system is that money's there to support people in the way that they want to live their lives. Um, there's lots of different ways you can get to that destination um, of where they want to get to, but it really the ultimate goal is to be able to, you know, help people um, support their lifestyle in the way that, um, you know, they want to be living it. So money serves that purpose to be able to do that. Yeah, nice. so, yeah. Interesting yeah. story. Yeah. It. So how long have you had the business for? How long have you been operating? Um, so officially, uh, I think it's nearly five years, but it's I been haven't. It's long already. Yeah, it has, but um, I haven't sort of been actively working in it um, until probably the last three years. So I've got um, two young children. So I started, I actually started the business after returning to, well, you know, sort of return from maternity leave with my first child. Um, and that's sort of when I decided to, um, you know, sort of go into starting my own business. And then I had my second child and he was really unwell when he was born. So I spent quite a lot of time in hospital and, and that really put, you know, sort of things in the business on hold. So it's sort of been, yeah, probably the last couple of years that I've really been, you know, back into the swing of things. Yeah. Yeah. And your son's better? Yes. So he's great him. now. Um, cool. Really good. So yeah, yeah. so it was a, a, certainly a bumpy ride in those <laughs> early days. Um, so he had sort of major heart problems when he was born, but they've Miracles of um, medicine these days. He's yeah, he's really good. Good, it's good to hear. And so, so prior to starting, well, I guess prior to maternity leave, if if you yep. started it after maternity leave with the first yep. child, yes. what were you doing before that? Yeah, so I'm I'm coming well, just over twenty years in financial services, which is um, showing my age. But when I um, I sort of. Uh, I, I did a bachelor's degree in um, commerce when I um, sort of went to uni and I didn't really want, know what I, like most young people, you don't know what you want to do when you when you grow up. Um, but I'd always done really well in accounting and maths and sort of, um, you know, sort of followed that pathway through and that's why I ended up doing a commerce degree, but still not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, and I was studying at Deakin Uni and they just introduced the financial planning um, as a like sub-major of their finance. Oh, yeah. So I was sort of the, one of the first ones to go through that. 
And as soon as I started, like this is honest to God, as soon as I started studying it, I was like, this is exactly what I wanted to wanted to do. I just knew straight away that that was um, the space I wanted to get into. I think just knowing that you could actually impact an individual's lives in an individual's life um, was really yeah powerful um, thing for me to go through. And then so, but it was really hard to get your foot in the door in financial planning. Um, 20 years ago. So I did start out in accounting and then, you know, eventually made some contacts and and um, went into a, a small uh, one-man sort of shop um, out in East Burwood. But that was a really great experience because he was a great advisor who just really genuinely cared about his clients. So it was a great, you know, it was a great intro to financial planning. Um, I then went on to work as an advisor with one of the big banks, which was an experience as well. Um, great training crowd, but not, um, you know, not sort of something where my values really aligned with, you know, sort of how that played out. And then I um, <clears throat> moved into a firm that was called WHK, so which became, you know, a number of other businesses that went along. But that was really a, an accounting, financial planning, self managed super fund finance firm. Um, and I had a long, you know, and the variations of that business as it went through. Um, so I had a long period of time working for them as an advisor and then into sort of operations strategy um, into the, you know, head office in, in sort of, and then into practice management there. Yeah, right. So you've, you know, you've had a couple of different businesses that you've worked in. Yep. Uh, I, I suspect through that process worked out who you do like to work with, who you don't like to work with. Right. You, you spoke about aligning with your values around the name. So who, yep. who is it that you're, that you tend to be working with now in your, in your current business? Who are your clients? Yeah, good. that's um, a great question. So I've been a female advisor and I've probably brought a bit of a female voice to, um, you know, in the way I, you know, sort of talk about financial planning. Um, my brand colours are all pinks and yeah. uh, all that sort of thing, which is, um, you know, so, I, I, so I, I'm attracting a lot of female clients. Um, yep. So I've got you know, and I do have some males as well, but I, I'm predominantly attracting male clients uh, what did I just say? <laughs> Female <laughs> clients. So those, you know, I've got um, you know, a whole range though, um, people, widows, divorcees, and it, ranging in from, you know, sort of um, the empty nesters to, you know, to younger families and to retirees. So I've got a full breadth, which is what I enjoy. I like the, you know, the different types of clients to work with. I think for me, what, what and this is probably, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to this but one of my probably big frustrations with the industry which I know a lot of advisors feel is that there's because the cost to produce advice is so high the cost to you know for clients to you know to get that advice is is also high so often it's the high net worth clients that you know that end up being seen by advisors because they're the ones that can afford it yeah um, and typically um you know I guess that's you know, those who are often in their retirement or really high income earners or, you know, heading towards retirement. So, you know, I try and um, I, I like to be able to help people sort of at least 10 years out from retirement. I think you make a really big impact in that space. Yep. Um, but that might lead us into talking about my money road school as well. <laughs> so, so, but how are you, so are, are you, no, I, I, I don't know, I remember a conversation that I had with you uh, years ago uh, about, uh, this idea of kind of some businesses set up in a way where it's almost like you're renting the rich guy's money, charging fees. Yeah, yeah. This comment that you made stuck with me for, for for years. I don't even know if you remember making it, but it stuck. It did. It stuck with me ever since. I guess are you are you engaging with people that aren't the really rich, high income earners, the wealthy clients, where most financial advice seems to have. Sure, there's a few businesses that are, that are doing other things, but are you working with those that maybe don't have the income or don't have the assets? And and how are you providing advice to them? What are you doing with them? What's yeah, you know? so um, yeah, yes and no. And I think this is where um, you know, because it does get to that cost benefit point. You know, like with, with what you have to charge to be able to provide that one on one personalized advice, which is my big frustration with the with the industry, which I know a lot of us have, but um, it, it just, yeah, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. But I, you know, um, and that's really where I've you know sort of brought in this part into my business, which is education based and being able to 
help provide the education know how to the pe- those pe- those you know that class I guess of clients or society so that then they can at least go about doing something um, before they and and know when to go and get the advice that they need um, but at least that they're getting some support before they're ready to you know to take that advice step yeah and you, you, you mentioned before your your pink colors and your branding and yep. you know follow your um your, your business instagram page and and it's like it's really polished it's really it, 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 there's a lot of it looks like a lot of care and that thought yep. has gone into that is that all is that all you did you work with someone is there someone that does your yeah does your graphics and things like how's that all work yeah a bit of both so i was very um very fortunate that i've got a cousin that has a a marketing firm right. and they really sort of helped me get off the grand ground in terms of my branding and um yeah i mean the look and feel of my business i sort of went to them and said I just want something completely different to the rest of the industry. I don't want any blue. I don't want any sort of masculinity about my branding at all. I want it to be really, um, yeah, soft and feminine and and just something that doesn't look like the typical, you know, financial um, services firm. Yep. So that was a very specific kind of request to them. Make it, yeah, fun and feel good. And and it wasn't it wasn't necessarily to be you know, anti-masculinity, it was also I wanted to make finance more um, exciting and digestible and fun and, you know, because you kind of look at, you know, this is probably, yeah, five years ago and you look at, you know, how big the Instagram, I mean, it still is, but was at that time and everyone's sort of scrolling pretty things and it's like, well, let's make something pretty that's like hopefully going to stop people in their tracks and get them a little bit excited about personal finance and has that from from a business building perspective? Is that like has Instagram been successful for you? Like, would like where yeah, do you, where your clients it's come been from? Hugely successful for me. Yeah. Um, it's blown me away. Actually, I always had the idea that it could be, um, but until you kind of try it out, you don't really know. Uh, and look, in the early days. Certainly, my clients. You know, a few came from word of mouth, but I've I've got a lot of clients that have come to me from Instagram, and I've never um, I've never said book an appointment with me or um, direct marketed by my Instagram channel. It's all been about you know trying to share, um, you know my um, you know my message just sort of coming across and provide education and and that sort of thing. But yeah, I've had a lot of clients come from that channel. And also um, the um, Money Mode School that I, I run, uh, you know, that's that's the big, um, I guess, you know, place where, where students come from yep. on there as well. So, yeah, it's been really successful part of my marketing my business. Hey, good one. Can, can you talk, so you mentioned Money Mode School. Yep. And as I said, before we started recording, I was really interested in what that is, how it came about, like what, yep. what you do. So, can you, can you talk us through what you call Money Yeah. Yep. So it's, um, I think that I would say that's my big passion project. Um, and when, you know, one of the, I guess, drivers when I, you know, sort of started my own business was, um, was wanting to, to, you know, one of the immediate things I wanted to do was to create this education, um, you know, platform, if you like, or, you know, um, resource for people. Um, but but it's a hard gig when you first start out because you don't have an audience to you know to tell about. So that's why it's been you know it's been a number of years I guess in the making in building up yeah building up um, people in my community that you know um, I, I guess is the best way to put it. But it really you know if I look back it was something that um, I'd always you know for a number of years thought was a great um, opportunity to do. Um, to be able to help people, I saw a massive gap in our industry. Like it was just sitting back and watching, you know, I think watching the barefoot investor phenomenon um, just really highlighted. And then as we talked about before, the cost of advice, there's like I just saw this massive gap. So everyone's buying this personal finance book, millions of people to read, to understand what to do with their money to and most of us advisors would look at that and go, oh, how does not how does everyone not know these, yes. you know, basic concepts? Um, then you start talking to your friend groups and all the rest of it. And particularly for me also that um, experience of being on maternity leave and going back to work. Like I had got myself 
in a well thought out position where I could choose when I wanted to go back to work and how many days and the rest of it. Whereas a lot of my peers around me who are well educated in good jobs and, you know, what you would perceive as reasonably financially well established were forced back to work because they couldn't, you know, sort of keep up with their lifestyle. So it was sort of, it's like there was this huge gap around, you know, just the basics for people could see that with all the millions of people buying this book and then there was nothing in between to financial <laughs> advice for thousands of dollars so um you know sort of that's where my sort of passion came around with creating the money mode school was to kind of be able to find a mi- sort of middle ground to that be able to give people a bit more support than the basics of a book um and to be able to educate them um and have a place where they can ask questions and get support and help but to really kind of yeah, build their financial knowledge, their financial literacy, get some of the basic foundations in place um, so that they're, you know, they're able to, yeah, get better at their personal finances. Yeah, right. So, so can can you talk us through like the structure of it? Is there yeah. like units that they do? Like what, what does it actually look like? Yeah, sure. So, um, so firstly, I mean, the reason I've called it the Money Mode School again is because, you know, it's sort of like money's not taught at school. So, this is um, the place where you can come and learn about all the things that you, you never learned. Um, and so, it, it really follows three key phases. So, the first um, – and so, there's a number. I think there's over 30 online lessons on there. Um, so, they have – you know, there's written content with those, like little workbooks. There's video tutorials um, that they can work through. So, it's yeah, as I said, it's set up in three phases. And um, the first phase is really about um, foundations. So, you know, cash flow, making sure you've got, um, you know, your worst case plan catered for, you've got emergency funds, you know, an overview of what insurances are all about. Like it's education-based, of course, yep. um, estate planning, debt and and navigating all of those sorts of things so it's really is the the basic foundations and then um the middle module middle sort of section i talk a lot about money mindset this you know around the psychology of money um touching on our money stories and um and the importance of you know really sort of thinking about um your values and creating your life plan that then allows you to create your goals because that's, you know, as I sort of said at the start, my big philosophy is I think the money side of things um, is there to underpin your life plan. So we spend a lot of time sort of in the middle talking about that. Um, and then the the last section is like really like, you know, educational content around building your wealth. So covering the basics of investing, the basics of superannuation and, you know, what retirement looks like in Australia. Yeah, right. And so, so it's is, big. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so is that is that you hosting like webinars with the the students that are enrolled and you and you yeah. following a course or or is it some portal that they just yep. get access to all of these resources? To- yep. So the nuts and bolts of it is a portal um, yep. with the ready made content in there, but I do um, so I'm running people through actually a six month program at the moment. So we started out as three months, and it's just because it's such a big piece of work. Um, we just found that, you know, people needed a longer period of time to do it. So people can work through it at their own pace. But in that six month period, I'm providing like a monthly, um, a monthly kind of masterclass, if you like, right. um, in there. And then we have a monthly like Q and A. So whereas they can, you know, bring their questions and I can sort of answer their questions and all of that sort of thing live. And I, I record those for the people that can't make it and then they can just watch those on replay. And I've got had some guests come in from time to time as well who'll run, you know, sort of special masterclasses. So I've had an estate planning lawyer, um, a life coach, um, these sort of, yeah, different yeah. different topics that sort of tie in but that might not be my um, expertise. Yeah. And so the so the, the monthly webinars or so, that, that's yep. keeping a pati- particular pace through the yes. Yes. monthly journey yep. and then around that, there's all the other resources that you've either That's pre-recorded right. yep. or written up that people can. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And I've sort of yep. got a workbook that they work through, you know, um, it's, yeah, sort of like a pathway to financial independence, if you like. And it's sort of um, giving them the tools to to build their own financial plan, 
along the way. Yep. Um, but very much point out to them the areas where, you know, this is an area where you might need advice, um, but at least they've kind of got some of the background knowledge when they go and speak to an advisor, whether that's me or someone else, about, you know, what they what they need to have thought about or what, you know, what they might be looking for. Because often people, you know, that don't have a lot of – because that's a real barrier to advice, I think, too, because you don't kind of know what you don't know. Um, so, yeah, so I want to sort of break that down as much as possible as well. Yeah, right. And, and so these people going through the school, they pay some particular fee, whatever you charge, charge yep. for the school – make their way through the, the six monthly program what, what do you find happens with these people at the end do they do, does, does a proportion of them turn around to you and say okay, I actually want full bone financial advice now like what yeah what's happening at yeah, the end yeah so yes I've had a couple that have done that um, mm-hmm. that have come through and said you know I want to do advice there might have been a couple that have just want scaled advice might be like can we just get some assistance with our assurance insurance? And then I've also had others who have said, I want to sit on another round because, you know, it, it is a lot to go through. Like, you know, when you work with clients one-on-one, how long it can take if you're doing a holistic plan, yeah. how long it can take to, you know, um, support them through getting everything in order. And I feel like a lot of that work, a lot of those it's that first module of all the basics and the foundations that does hold a lot of people up um, because it is overwhelming for them to deal with all the, you know, it's a lot of the life admin stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, the investing in whatever's the exciting part of it and people often want to jump straight into like let's just start investing. It's like you've got nothing in order over here and you yeah. don't even know why you're investing. So, you know, we kind of need to yeah go back and sort those things out. So how are you – so for and this isn't necessarily people that have come through money mode school, yep. but, but just yep. in general, what is your engagement with clients look like? What, what what's your process? If I was a brand new client and I said, "Hey Renee, I need some help," like wh- yep. what what what's your process look like? Yeah, pr- probably not very different to yours. Um, you know, I you know a client will make an inquiry um i will try and get a bit well i'll get a bit of information from them up front they'll fill out a short questionnaire we'll have our first meeting um really sort of trying to flesh out what they're you know what they're trying to achieve or what their goals and their objectives are and then i'll go away and put together a a short proposal for them yep um and I'll send that out to them. In some cases, we'll get together and just go through the proposal because, um, you know, we always want to make sure we can make an impact for them and that they're going to be benefiting them, getting advice and what sort of benefits they're going to get from it. Um, they'll say, yes, we want to go ahead. And then it's just working on that normal um, process. We'll gather a lot of information, um, have a number of meetings, get to advice presentation stage and then you know, depending on what type of client is will depend on what sort of ongoing service um, yep. we put in place. Are, are you yeah. using any tools to do that? Like I know, you know I've heard other podcasts with other advisors talking about that there's some that get really deep into like the cash flow, cash yep. flow budgeting, whatever you want to call it, and they're using various apps yep. and my prosperity or whatever they might be to, um, are, are you using any of that? Yeah, so we have been using my prosperity. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, so and that's been – and again, it, like some clients really love it. Like I think the younger clients really kind of love it. Um, it's – I really had hoped, I, I suppose, that it would become more of a cash flow-based thing for clients. But, you know, I think once you've got your initial cash flow set up and it's ticking along all right, that ongoing monitoring of it's not really needed – Okay. Um, but it has been a great, um, I guess, front end experience for clients. Yeah, I tried. This is going back years ago, before you know, the likes of my prosperity and some of these others were around. Like there was a like a, um, a simplified down version of zero that that I yes. used a few clients for a while, and similar to your experience. That and there's one one particular client that getting deep into what they were spending their money on, and yeah, bring to this client, and they have to. You have to earn X amount of money to pay tax to then pay your gardeners. Like, you know, you had $15,000 a year paying in your garden. You're actually having to earn 30000 They made some massive changes. But but outside of that, outside from this one client, it, I found it was, yeah, a lot of work for yep. not a lot of reward for the client. And, and, and other advisors find a lot of success in that. Yeah. Look, I find um, 
I, I think, you know, sort of doing that detailed cash flow and diagnostic work, I suppose, in the, that initial stage can be really important and powerful for people. Um, but I try and stay away from monitoring every dollar on an ongoing basis too, sort of, and that's where I, you know, from a cash flow point of view, encourage people to, you know, get it. And you've got to know your numbers. You have to know your numbers to know, you know, what you've got to do. But it's sort of like let's now then, you know, a bit of a bucket approach for their spending. So yeah. Go, well, give yourself, like, let's use the detailed cash flow to set your, um, you know, set your cash flow model up to start with. But then, um, you know, try not to be watching every single dollar that you're spending because we're, we're so, we want to focus on the big picture. We want to focus yeah. on the outcome of the goals too. Hmm. And so you, you mentioned a couple of young young children. Like how, how are you operationally, how are you running the business? Is it just you yep. on your own? Do you have some type of support? Like how many days a week are you working? Like what, what does the business look like for you? Yeah, so – now because um, – so I've got a, um, a full-time – or she's not full-time actually. She's three days a week um, support person who works with me. So that was – that's been almost 12 months. So it was, you know, I, I started the business from scratch. I didn't buy any clients. I didn't um, – because I hadn't been in an advisor role for five or so years, I didn't have clients that, you know, came over with me. So I started from ground zero. Yeah. Um, so it was, um, you know, it was – like I wore every single hat in those first couple of years, which was pretty intense at times. Um, but yeah, got to a position last year where I put on um, a part-time sport person, Kerry, who's was been an absolute game changer for me. Um, and I do outsource little bits here and there. Um, so I do now have someone on and off that helps me a little bit with my social media, doing some you know content and content on my website, um, newsletters and things like that. And so I just sort of outsource bits and pieces of that, um, and have you know power planning support as well. So I you know I also because I have got the young kids and that was a bit of a decision in starting my own business as well. Is I want to be there for school drop off and school pick up and be able to you know take them to after school activities and. Um, be the parent helper in the classroom from time yeah. to time. So um, I try to I try to stick to four days a week, um, but that can be spread over some nights, some weekends. But it gives me flexibility during the day. So yeah, I'm trying to get better at my work life balance every <laughs> week. <laughs> and and I've, I've I've spoken to a couple of other people that have started their business from scratch. Someone I was speaking to recently is like really in the in the early stages of starting. How and when do you know when to get that first support? You, know, you mentioned someone that you've got that's working with you part-time now. Yeah. How, like, how did you know when to do that? Was it when you thought, I had the money in the business to afford it? It was yep. like, yeah. what decision did you come to? Yeah, I, for me it was that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm quite conservative um, in terms of like business projections and things like that. I, I probably could have bought her on earlier in, in hindsight having her having someone earlier would have been um, a lot less stressful for me but it was so challenging to find someone that's the other you know really challenging to find someone um she's actually based in Brisbane I'm in Melbourne so um but you know so much done online now that it, it works fine so for me it was sort of uh it was a bit of a financial decision I'd sort of like I've got to get to this point before I can um you know sort of justify putting someone on um but yeah, you look back in hindsight and you go, well, I probably could have done it a bit sooner. Yeah, right. Because yeah. it allows you then to see more clients, to do, you know, to do more um growth activities. But yeah, I I sort of waited until I was nearly, you know, burnt You're out, done. busy. <laughs> like yeah. So anyway, so it's been yeah, it's been a great experience having her on board. Yeah. And you said recruitment was challenging. Um we find yeah. that here if if someone, an advisor, client services, whatever, whatever leaves. Like who what were you advertising on Seek? Like what were you advertising for? So I did LinkedIn. I did Seek um, to no avail uh, yeah. and believe it or not, found her on Instagram. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, through, so that network's been incredible for me. So another advisor, I, th- I, um, I think I might have posted on there that I was looking for somebody and um, I think another advisor knew this person and, yeah, and recommended them. And so it was, yeah, so that kind of blew me away. And so, what what's next for you? What are you what are you working on next? Yeah, um, so I really really want to um, 
you know, sort of continue to tweak, improve and grow and develop the money mode school. I think that's, um, you know, if I look back, uh, I probably was dreaming about that eight to 10 years ago about being able to do something like that one day. Um, but the reality is that, you know, it is, it's, it's a different business model to advice. Like that's probably been my biggest learning curve, like course creation and financial advice are two completely different types of businesses. Um, so I would like to, you know, probably get some more support in my business around that side of things and to be able to, you know, to continue to build and, and develop that. Yeah. How many people are you getting going through the course? Um, so I've got about 35 through at the minute um, going through, so not huge numbers. Um, I've done different iterations of the course leading up to this. So this is really my first official round of the Money Mode School. Um, I had run what I called a kickstart course in the past, um, which was a lower price point. It was a shorter period. It was a um, six-week course and it was really around the real sort of cash flow basics and foundation. Yep. And I had much higher uptakes on that, but I just found then they needed something else and they were they really weren't ideal um, or they weren't ready for advice. So being able to sort of build out the school. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to continue to sort of tweak that and find. I don't think I've quite nailed exactly where I, you know, where it needs to be right now. But, um, yeah, to continue to develop, that would p- probably be my next focus. And I'm sure that's something that will just continue to evolve over time as – yeah. Industry changes as your interests change. Yeah. I, I, I don't imagine there'd ever be a point where, hey, my money mode school's finished and you don't touch it for five years. Yeah. Yep. Surely you'd be tinkering with it all the time. Yeah. 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 Continuing to do that. And I think, you know, in terms of the advice business, it's it's a really, I'm in a bit of a quandary at the moment about how I move that forward um, because there's only so much one advisor can take on um, and I sort of think, do I take on another advisor or do I just sort of cap my clients at a certain point, bring on more support staff, but it sort of then comes into, yeah, how I want to grow that forward. So, I mean, yeah, over the next few ne- few years, I need to decide um, what I want to do with that as well. Mm. It's a tough point that to get to, you know, um, yeah. this that I work in, it's at, it's at the other end of the spectrum. There's lots and lots of people here, but other you know, friends and colleagues in, in financial advice getting to that same point where they're saying, you know, I'm I'm the one advisor, I'm wearing all the hats. Yes, you know, I've got a bit of support, whether it's you know, interstate or overseas or, or or sitting next to you. But it's how do you get what what do you do? Do you just cap it at the one advisor and just yep. do your hours and then that's it? Or roll the business into something bigger and buys you time to keep doing the things that you want to do, but there's more people around that can support you. It's a yeah, tough thing for everyone, I think. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, but I think you know, it it's just shown to me that there's that there is no shortage of clients out there and people needing advice and support. For sure. So hopefully we can attract more advisors <laughs> into the industry. We need to. Yeah. To be able to do that. Good. All right, Renee. Well, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, James. Nice to hear about the Money Mode School. Wish you all the best with it. Thank you. It's always nice to reflect on the story and, you know, you're sort of in it every day. So it's nice to sort of go back and, and look at the last few years and how it's all evolved. Yeah, you kind of yeah, reflect and appreciate what, what you've built over time. Good on you. Yeah. Good one. Well, thanks, Renee. No worries. Thanks for having me. See you, James. Bye. This material does not contain and should not be relied on for financial, accounting, legal or tax advice. Schroeder's does not give any warranty as to the accuracy, reliability or completeness of information presented. Visit www.schroeders.com.au forward slash advisors for more information about our funds.